gone quite slowly up until this point. Just trying to ease you into the notion of how the CUDA kernels are constructed. What, what is the actual CUDA code? And secondly, what, what do you have to do on the host to set up the problem, launch the problem, collect the results? That's, that's, that's basically what we've been, we've been building up to pretty slowly. Um, what was the rationale behind the thread model that maps neatly to the architecture? What drove the architectural choices? So now we're going to speed up a little bit. Just to recap, the whole thing about CUDA, CUDA the genius, is in the thread model. But I think that's also one of the, the execution is one of the, one of the things that people find difficult, which is the fact that they've divorced the inner loop of the parallel for loops, they've divorced it from the loop structure. The loop structure is sort of ex deus machina. It's basically lurking behind the scenes, and you actually have to know what these thread, um, thread rank variables are and how to get them, how to form uh, a parallel sort of parallel for loop structure with that implicit loop structure, yes. I go back to the 512 yes. that we chose. So that's the size of the array that we have. Yes. But isn't that number supposed to be tailored to somehow the, the GPU? Too early to optimize. That's not talk optimize, optimization. Um, the upper bound on that on, on CUDA is 1024. So you can do clever things, or you could just try every length that you wanted and just see which one's fastest, right? But let's not optimize yet. I notice I'm not talking about optimization yet. It's a, it's, it should be a separate issue from core expression. Now, there are some other little decorations that are used inside the kernel. So we specify that this is an actually a kernel with this underscore, underscore, global, underscore, underscore. What else is going on here? Oops. We use the thread rank, which is this multidimensional thread rank, and map that to an index. So this is where we're explicitly deciding we've, put, we've given a thread array. How do we relate that thread array to a partition of a, par of a job into parallel tasks with this two-level parallelism? Blocks of things to do and things that happen inside that block. And finally, we decide what we're going to do, and we do it. And that's what every thread is doing. Okay, So every thread executes the body of this kernel. And we've downloaded that, so we're good. We're doing this. Ha, huh, it was already in my slides. I'm pretty predictable. OK, right. So you've already got that. Hopefully, how many people have managed to run the example now? OK, keep trying. Keep trying to get on there. OK, so now just to, just to up the ante a little bit, we've gone from pretty, pretty stupid example where we're just taking an array and filling an array entry by entry with a thread for each entry. Let's do something a little bit more complicated, which is Rusty's example, which is just a setup of a um, finite difference uh, discretization of elliptic Poisson problem. So Laplace in U equals F with some homogeneous Dirichlet boundary data. So finite difference, we know we're going to express the solution as a set of values at nodes on a grid, Cartesian grid. It didn't come out very well, apologize for that. Um, by the way, I've, we've re-uploaded the uh, slides, so you should be able to download them without password. I'm sorry about that. OK, now at every node, we're going to approximately assert that this uh, uh, PDE is, is um, valid based on local interpolation of nodal data from the grid. So we replace those partial differential operators by difference terms. Basically, it comes from take the solution at the nodes and create an interpolation. So three points in one direction, three points in the other direction, create a quadratic interpolation in both directions, differentiate that quadratic interpolation, and you come up with this classic uh, difference formula that approximates those differential operators. 
So we end up with a constraint system. Basically says, if we want to solve for these u's values at each of the nodes, then we have to solve this coupled system that relates all the, um, well, locally, the dependence in the stencil of the nodes in the stencil, or the values of the nodes of the stencil, and relates those to the forcing function which is just a long march to get to a linear system. So we're going to take that linear system, and we want to solve ax equals b, but we're going to do this using a classic um, Jacobi iteration. So we're going to create an iterative scheme where we will um, index the iterates by k, and then the k will tell us which iterate we are. We're going to evaluate this center node value at the next iteration level, the off-center uh, entries in the stencil will evaluate at the previous iteration, and from that we'll back out an iterative scheme. So here's the thing we're going to iterate. So given the values, so we'll have an initial starting value, guess for the solution, u, we'll just set that to zero. Given the initial guess and the values of the forcing function, we can bootstrap first guess, which will be u1. Then we will iterate. This is classic stuff, but sometimes there are people who haven't seen it, and I just want to be clear what we're doing. Um, now, there's another step, which is we're going to have to decide when, we have, when the solution is good enough. So we'll look at the difference in the value of the solutions at two iterates, take an L2 norm over those uh, values, the difference of those values, and then if, while it's uh, that tolerance, while that error is not all that residual change is, is too big, we'll keep iterating, okay? So there you go, that's our numerical scheme. Now we have to think about partitions. Is there a natural partition for this? Please volunteer one. Hmm? Do we even have to tile this problem? What's the simplest possible par uh, parallel partition you can think of? One node on each thread. So if we look at the parallel dependency, let's we'll bring it back to, so when we update the value here, it depends on the values here, but it doesn't change them. So we have embarrass an embarrassingly parallel iterative scheme down to the level of the node. So it's the simplest possible thing you can do is as exactly was suggested, which is send one node through, process one node per thread, right? And again, what have we done? We've inspected the data dependency of the output data and we've devised a partition with a maximally parallel partition based on the dependency of the output data. Okay? There's, if we'd had a more complicated uh, iterative scheme, then we wouldn't be able to do this so easily. So for instance, uh, Gauss-Seidel would, would create some loop carried dependencies. Right? As, you, as you go down the triangle or up the triangle, then you, you um, create some possibility for uh, rewrite contention. So what we've done here is got the simplest possible iterative scheme, and it just so happens to have a beautiful parallel description, which is node-wise parallel, embarrassingly parallel, okay? But there are two things going on here. This is the easy one. I gave you the partition of the node-by-node no node by node partition. That's pretty obvious, right? That's easy. What about this, the termination criterion? That's actually a little bit harder, right? Because it does have a loop carry dependence because we have an accumulating sum inside this loop. So we have to think about that. But I think you guys, and I wasn't here for it, but I think you guys have already done some reduction work, right? So this is just a classic reduction. But we have to think about how do we do reduction on these many core processes? And um, it's up to us to do it. You can use some libraries, but let's think about this as the thing we're going to take away from this, this example, okay? So the iteration, that's pretty straightforward, right? At each node, 
you just read the data in, update the solution or solution vector, move on, right? And it, obviously in the simplest possible kernel, that's what we do. In serial, we would just loop over all the nodes, figure out where we are in this two-dimensional grid, and then we have to do some reconstruction, right? Because you've got two indices, right? You have to patch them together to get to the linear array that we always have um, to represent the solution. And then we'll just translate this into code. Hopefully I got all the signs right, okay? This is a simple case. So when we translate this into CUDA, not much changes. We just lose those for loops and we turn them into parallel for loops which disappear behind the scenes. And we just have a contract between the person who wrote the kernel and the person who writes the host code to call the kernel that we're in fact going to set up a two-dimensional array of threads. And then we can partition that however we like. It doesn't really matter, okay? So all we have is we've just guaranteed that there's enough blocks and each, thread, each block has enough threads in each direction, in two directions, so that we can tile that two-dimensional grid, okay? And then it's just a matter of checking to see if this thread is a legal thread in a legal part of the finite difference grid, then it can do something, and it does exactly what the serial code did. So we have that straightforward transition between serial code and CUDA code. You just have to decide which loops you're parallelizing, how you're going to chunk them up, and then just relate it and make sure that your host specification of thread array is matched by what the, the kernel does for each thread in that thread array. Okay. This is a pretty stupid implementation. But that's okay. We're not trying to optimize yet. In fact, we're not going to spend too much time today optimizing because that's a, sort of a rabbit hole of, of misery. But, but that expresses the basic idea. It's the second instance where we've said, this is how you partition. Simple problem, embarrassingly parallel. But let's look at that reduction. That reduction is more interesting. The reduction has a loop carry dependence because it has an accumulating register when we compute this sum, right? If we wrote this as a for loop, the for loop, the next, uh, each iteration depends on the previous iterations of the for loop, okay? So let's just simplify this to a, to a generic reduction operation, okay? We just want to sum up the entries in a vector. It doesn't matter where they come from, how they're formed, whatever. They're just a linear vector, okay? We're going to partition that sum. That's the obvious thing, right? I should have asked you, how would you split up a sum in an embarrassingly parallel way where you break it up into a set of small sums? We could keep recursively doing. That's effectively what we're going to do. But let's just take the first partition, the coarse partition, which is for work blocks that go to streaming model processors to cores, we'll make them the outer sum then the inner sums can be done independently. That's the embarrassingly parallel part, right? But now we have inner sums that have loop carried dependence. So we can't just say, you thread, you do the sum, you do a sum, you do a sum, and use a sum without lots of backwards and forwards in memory, okay? So we're gonna try and avoid lots of loading and storing uh, data from uh, the device memory, because you know that has high latency. Is this clear? Step one, find some embarrassingly parallel. We've done that. Step two is how do we do this in a sum in a reasonably parallel fashion? And there is going to be no mystery here. This is not cutting bleeding edge stuff. We're just going to do something straightforward. The natural thing to do is just to do a tree reduction on the vector inside the um, work group, which is inside a set of threads that have been mapped to the core, okay? So for this example, I have eight threads. They all load in a value from the block, the tile, in the vector, okay? So they suck in the block of, of data from the vector, and then I'm brutal. I'm going to kill half of them, right? Bullet to the head, dead thread. 
again, it's very, very sad end for a thread. But after the first iteration, I'm only going to use half my threads. OK? So the sequence will be load, everybody loads in a value. Y by half threads. The remaining threads can do the first addition. So if we've loaded this into the, the shared memory that we talked about earlier, all threads in the thread block have access to the shared memory. So they will, these threads that are still alive, kind of scared, but alive, they'll do one sum each. So for easy indexing, we'll take uh, thread zero, we'll add, add the entry from thread four and its, uh, its own value and write it again to shared memory. OK? Then it's walking dead thread time. Dead thread will kill these two threads here. We're down to two threads. Again, the two threads that are left will add up their values plus the, th the values from the threads that were just alive. We're down to two values. Kill that last that thread there. And we're down to the last thread standing. We've got the sum. OK? So we've relied on shared memory as a shared scratch space so that we can communicate values between threads. Now, the interesting thing about shared memory, the reason why we use it and not device memory is because device memory has huge long latency, 1,000 cycle latency. Shared memory, if accessed in a parallel way, will give you latency on, your, on the order of single digits, possibly double digit latency, because it's collocated with the ALUs, approximately. It's approximate to the ALUs. OK, so in pseudocode, each thread in the thread box uh, has to find its rank. We'll decide that all threads are alive when we start. All threads will read into a shared memory array. While there's still more than one thread alive, we'll synchronize because now we have to worry about synchrony between threads. Remember, the threads get processed in batches 32. So there's some possible asynchrony in the processing of the thread block. So if you've got 512 thread blocks, every operation is batch processed into 32. So what's 512, 32, 16? Is that about right? So it would take 16 passes through the SIMD lanes to, to process all of those 512 threads. So um, not all threads in the thread block get processed simultaneously. So we have to make sure that before we start accessing entries in the shared memory, everybody who's going to write to that shared memory has already written to it. So we put a barrier in. Then once we have a barrier, we kill half the, sh half the threads, if we're still lucky, then we do our sum, and then we repeat till there's just one thread standing. And then at the end, when there is just one thread standing, that thread will write out the result to a vector. Okay. Now, we haven't done the full reduction. What do we do next? Well, this is just on the local, so now I have to take the, the, the partial, partial sums and put them together to find out the result. Yes, so how do we do that? On the host, that's option number one, because we've taken a vector and divided its length by 256. Right, so we've really compressed that vector down. Or? One core to do it. You could add the results from the device memory and one core to do the sum. Yep, that's another way. Anybody else? Well, there's ways you can do it where it's like a compaction, you do it over multiple. Right? Yep, you guys have answered all the questions. So you just call this kernel again, just with a shorter length vector. At some point, you have to be careful, though, because the overhead for launching a kernel can be quite large. So the last five times that you call it to do that reduction could cost as much as copying the data from the device to the host and doing the reduction on the host. There are some things that the, the CPU is actually better at doing than the GPU, and one of them is these global operations. Um, if the data is not too large and fits in cache and so on, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so how do we realize that in an actual CUDA code? 
Well, it's the same syntax as we've seen before with just a couple of extras. In order to designate an array as a shared memory array, we say underscore shared, underscore, underscore, shared, underscore, underscore. Um, Uh, there, we're just accessing it like we normally would access an array. You do have to be careful that you don't have multiple threads accessing the same entry in shared memory because the outcome is unspecified. And you don't want to do that anyway. You just have a race, uh, a, write can, a write race. Okay. And then, in order to in inject a barrier, and it's a, a work group level barrier. All threads have to enter this barrier into the sync threads before any thread exits that barrier. Okay? So no thread can get passed here before all threads have gone into this function call or this macro. Okay? Um, so there you go. I've put a fully realized version of the elliptic solver in the examples directory, CUDA examples. And you'll see it's as simple as that. There are two parts of this. One was the node-wise parallel update. That's one kernel. We identified how to partition that, and we say, well, the simplest possible partition is the embarrassing parallel. Every node has a thread partition. And the second kernel is the reduction kernel. The reduction kernel basically involves divide and conquer, divide the sum up into subsums, and then in the, each subsum, in the tightly coupled SIMD cores do a tree reduction on that subsum using shared memory. And the only caveats there, we have to be careful that we make sure that the, any writes to shared memory and any reads to shared memory are protected by barriers to make sure that now's a good time to actually read or write from that shared memory array. Okay. And there you go. So that is, in essence, uh, you, if, if you've got all that stuff mastered, the idea of thread arrays, the idea of high latency, the idea of latency hiding through massive parallelism, redundant parallelism, the idea of using shared memory, the idea that the Resources in the cores are actually limited when you look at the number of floating point units, units versus register space and shared memory space. Then what we've seen here are fairly, fairly natural uh, outcomes. Basically, kernels which are pretty lightweight, they just take a few registers, a few variables, registers being the fastest available variables to the core, to the APUs, ALUs in the core. And in the case of shared memory, we weren't using very many K worth of shared memory for the reduction. So you might be tempted to just load up a huge shared memory array, but we can't do that because we're resource constrained. So we shouldn't over request shared memory. We shouldn't over request registers. Now, this is something you'll gain through experience, which is as you write more and more code, you say you realize that you can't take your 4,000 line code of Fortran, wrap it into a CUDA kernel and expect it to run. You may just have a register explosion, a register bomb that just won't work. So typically what we find is atomization, and the degree of atomization depends largely on experiment as to how you should partition a problem, how many times you have to load and store data given the specific partition of a problem. So this is something I can't teach you for every example, give you a recipe that will tell you how to, to paralyze. And I've put an example, the Jacobi example. There's a CUDA version, OpenCL version, and um, so on. OK. Right. Since you've all got lots of spare time, um, I'm joking. Uh, there are some suggested activities that would bootstrap you up to some improved level of competency in, in fundamental basic CUDA programming, um, starting with um, learning more about event-based event -based, uh, timing, which actually I've moved away from to some extent, extending the stencils for the problem. Once you think about going to higher order stencils, so five-point stencils, seven-point, nine-point, then suddenly you'll feel like you're doing a lot of redundant loads and stores. Well, a lot, 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 of, lot of redundant loads, 
So you might start thinking that you should take a, uh, for every um, work block, you should take a chunk of the finite difference grid, load it into shared memory, and work on the data from shared memory instead of going, always going back to device memory to pick out the values from the finite difference stencil. So if you think about a chunk of nodes, every um, node in the interior could be loading data from shared memory without having to go back from, to device memory. So there are lots of ways you can tune and optimize this kind of kernel, but this is not necessarily the right venue to dig too deep into to the optimization strategies, but we'll talk about some optimization. Um, if you're feeling ambitious, start using MPI and CUDA. MPI and CUDA is pretty straightforward. You're just using standard MPI. And now when you have to say in this, in this example, you would have some halo exchanges. Those halo exchanges between GPUs would have to be mediated by, say, MPI. Okay, so that's added an extra level of copying. So now, previously, when you used MPI, you would just copy from one process to another process. Now you'll have to copy from the device to the process that's running the device, and from that process to another process, and it would copy from its uh, host memory to device memory. So you've added an extra level of copying, an extra level of latency, so you have to watch out for uh, scaling issues there. Use red-black numbering, and so on, and so on, and so on. Lots of neat ideas here. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about performance. Not too much, because you'll get scared. So I've got a few jokes here. Um, so everybody knows this definition, right? Supercomputers are a device for turning compute bound problems into I.O. bound problems, right? You should have seen that, right? Basically, every large scale supercomputing problem is a disk problem, right? You've got ample, you've got unbounded compute, but you've got bounded disk capability, capacity. Relatedly, a many core processor is a device turning compute bound problem into a memory bound problem. It's the same issue. The non-proximal data transpose is always going to be the big issue. On a supercomputer is how do you load a million cores? On the GPU, how do you feed 2,880 floating point units? given that you have physical limitations. This is a quote from Kathy Yellick. Um, and then my favorite one, which I saw yesterday, is arithmetic is cheap. Think about the GPU, 2,800 floating point units. Bandwidth is money. That's basically infrastructure, right? How many lanes you're willing to build, how much cache and so on. Latency is physics. So there's always the fundamental limit of, of travel time, right? So we've got to keep those things in mind when we think about optimizing for GPUs. So in the context of GPUs, if you have to do a few extra flops to reconstruct a value that otherwise you would have had to load from memory, then maybe you can get some performance. I've never found that to be the actual case. Generally, to um, generate some data on the fly requires data. And the data has to come from somewhere. So a lot of people will say flops are free. Well, they're not really because they always take input. Okay, and in a very limited number of cases is that uh, are flops really free. Oh, and then since Nvidia's watching, um, why have GPUs been successful? It's not really about thousands of floating point units per chip. It's because the, the magic secret ingredient is the f they've put in fast memory with large bandwidth. So you can flow 300 some gigabytes of data past the, the processing unit, which could be much less powerful and still get the same overall effect. Um, now, unfortunately, this is expensive. A large part of the expense that you, uh, the cost of the, the highest end large memory GPUs is the memory. That's what, really what you're paying for in the high end carts. Now, talking about latency, there are different classes, different memory spaces. So register have very low latency. 
Well, that's not quite true. Um, if you generate a read-write um, dependency, is that right? Write-read. If you write to a register and then immediately want to read from it afterwards, that can generate a 24-cycle stall. So it's not quite true that the latency for register memory is one. So you have to be a bit careful about that. And it's, uh, the register variables are good for the lifetime of the thread. Local memory I avoid. It's basically off device memory. Uh, shared memory is on chip. Latency, that's very optimistic. I think that's wrong. I'll just add a zero, and you're probably closer to the number there. Global device memory, that's the memory off chip but on board, is on the order of 1,000 cycles. And it's good for the life of the application. So if you load data on there, when you start running, it'll be on there till you either kill the array or the application stops. Then there's some extra caching, but they're a little bit um, specialized. Right. OK. Now, in our hypothetical um, GPU design, abstract GPU design, we made a big play about hiding latency by multiple contexts. And there's the most primitive way you can imagine to actually figure out how many contexts can be co-resident at any one time. How many active warps can be active, or, sorry, active thread blocks can be resident at one time from which you can decide how well are you using the um, core. You can go and download their occupancy calculator, which is literally a spreadsheet. And if you type in the compute model, the amount of shared memory, and how many threads you're using on the thread block, and how many registers per thread, which you can find out somehow, and the shared memory per block, it can tell you basically how many of the floating point units you're using at any one time in percentage. And we're back to the ego thing. One point in time, people worried about having maximum occupancy. But then, and that would mean having a very small number of single digit number of registers, very small amount of shared memory, and then you could have all the floating point units computing all the time. But it's not necessarily the most efficient way to write code. There are some uh, positive uh, ways to look at this in terms of just maximizing bandwidth instead of maximizing compute. So it might be the case that instead of Right, atomizing your job into such small tasks that you have to keep loading and reloading data, you can load the data once, do lots of stuff with it, and then write it out, have lower occupancy, but still achieve higher performance. So it's all a matter of experimentation, I'm afraid. But this will give you some insight. Now, we're talking about performance, and we use shared memory for a very specific reason. We, we wanted to do that reduction or partial reduction blockwise without loading in data, doing a partial reduction, writing it out to device memory, which takes a thousand cycles, reading it in from device memory, which takes a thousand cycles, and then repeating. We didn't want to do that. Okay? So we use shared memory, which is single or double digit uh, latency, if you access it in a prescribed fashion. So then we have to think about how shared memory is, how how it's designed. Um, so in the NVIDIA GPUs, there are 32 banks of shared memory, which essentially means there's 32 memory managers that can simultaneously provide values from shared memory. OK? And they're interleaved. So if you have a linear array, and this is the offset in the linear array, then the first entry in the array is bank 0, assuming it's aligned to a page boundary. First entry is 0, next one will be 1, then 2, 3. Basically, you can see that although you think of it as a linear array and you think it's a ch contiguous chunk of memory somewhere, it's actually your array is split over 32 separate banks of memory. And those, each bank can issue, or you can query each bank uh, within a few cycles and get a value out of shared memory. OK? But the problem is that if you oversubscribe to one of the banks, you can get into trouble. So we'll see what happens. 
It's OK if, if you basically had thread 0 reading from bank 0, thread 1 from bank 1, and so on. OK? That's, that's fine, fine and dandy. There's 32 independent memory transactions. Everybody can do that. Everybody's happy with doing the memory read in parallel. You can even take it from non-consecutive entries as long as each thread is querying a different bank, right? So that's OK. They have a memory manager that, that basically makes sure this is OK. You can even do this. Every thread can read from one bank. Well, that's OK. That's pretty obvious. That's a broadcast. It just it gets routed. That entry gets routed to all threads in the, in the same time as every thread reading from a different bank. This would be bad. So if you line up your data in such a way that every thread is reading from the same bank, then that access gets serialized. Now, this may not, well, so this is a well-known problem, and it comes up over and over again whenever you have shared memory. This is a recurrent problem in history. It's just relabeled or reemerges every time there's a new shared memory architecture. So this is well understood. Um, a simple example would be when you have a matrix transpose you want to do. World's second most boring example. But let's assume you have 1,024 by 1,024 matrix, and you want to transpose it. Well, the natural thing you might do is break it up into blocks of 32 by 32, as 1,024 threads would read in one entry each from a sub-block. You would load it into shared memory, and then you'd read from the shared memory transpose. So if every thread in that case wrote to a different bank, which is the way it would work out in the naive code, when they went to read from the shared memory, and to guarantee that they're doing a coalesced write, well, we'll talk about coalescing later, it's a different issue, um, then they would likely read rows instead of columns. So you would run into bank conflicts, and that's where first came up in GPUs, people became aware of it. When they were trying to look at simple elementary operations like that. Okay. Now, I let slip the magic word coalescer or coalescing. Um, this is actually a quite a complicated issue, and I'm going to give you an incorrect abstraction to try and understand what's going on. The GPU has a coalescer that collects memory requests, so when the core, the, the, um, the SIMD lane, or the SIMD lanes, so if you took uh, 32 of these SIMD uh, uh, floating point units and they all request memory, there's a, from the off-chip memory here, all of the floating point units, sorry, um, all those requests get funneled into a coalescer that tries, it's kind of an OCD, so it's an obsessive compulsive uh, coalescing unit, which tries to recognize that this is looking for requests which are contiguous blocks of memory in the device partition. Each of those chips is called a partition. So what it's looking for is its ideal case is if, if all the threads in the SIMD group 32 threads ask for 32 floats aligned to a page boundary in the partition. Okay? That's its ideal case. Because then it doesn't have to keep doing some address setup. So when you talk to the memory manager, the memory manager has to figure out where is the actual data that you're asking for. So if it can coalesce those um, memory requests into block memory requests, saves a lot of time. Okay? Um, and then the coalescer will issue requests through these independent memory managers and so on. So the recipe there is that when you have threads accessing device memory, it really pays to use unitary stride access of the device memory. Threads 0 through 32, 0 through 192 should access entries that have index 0 through 192 offset by the page size from the start of the vector. Okay? This is not unusual for CPU optimization, where you would also aim to use aligned cache reads, right? Okay, 
but it's just something to keep in mind. Um, the cache is doing a good job of smoothing over some of these issues, but to get optimal code, you really need to pay attention to coalescing, which is just the issuing of contiguous blocks of requests from threads. And as I said, CPU optimization, GPU optimization really aren't that different anymore. Um, on the CPU, you're trying to optimize cache reuse, so you use localized block uh, prefetches for uh, optimized uh, cache usage. And you would attempt to do vectorization. Well, what we're doing here is wide vectorization, 32 wide vectorization. So writing code for CPU, writing code for GPU, the optimizations are very similar. The other thing that we're trying to do is optimize the independence of the work groups or the work blocks that we're trying, blocks of work we're trying to do. So on the CPU, you would consider embarrass, uh, you get best performance out of multi-threading if you have independent threads doing their own thing without too many barriers, without too many joins, forks, and so on, okay? And it's the same thing on the GPU. So it's basically an expression of um, how GPU and CPU optimization is similar. So ideally, you'd have work groups on the GPU, no communication between the work groups to avoid deadlocks, and they're designed for independent group parallelism and also, at all costs, avoid data race dependencies between blocks. There are atomic operations that let you avoid um, race conditions, but they are going to inevitably serialize your code to some degree. Now, for the work items, that's the threads inside the work blocks. Um, they're executed in parallel. You can share, but then if you're going to share through shared memory, then you're going to have to use barriers. And again, the same way that you, you want to avoid inter-block dependencies, then you should avoid inter-thread um, race dependencies between work items. So really, if you look at how we optimize for GPUs and CPUs, there's a lot of commonality. There's sort of almost a one-to-one -one correspondence. So this is one problem that we have in CFP techniques, right? I mean, CFP simulations. Uh, Usually, the, the amount of data that you need to process is larger than the amount of like, uh, than the memory on the on the device. Multiple devices. Okay, so so your approach would be to actually distribute the data. MPI plus. Everything, and then keep the, the whole population on the device. If at all possible, yes. And if not, then then you can get into streaming. But then streaming may, so you'll take data and while you're computing, you'll, you'll start diminishing, degrading the performance as, as you inevitably run into that eight, uh, six or 12 gigabyte per second uh, PCI Express bottleneck. But it also means that you might need to uh, rewrite completely your code. Not going to lie. Yes. Um, what we found, though, is when we've written good GPU code, it backports really nicely to CPU code. That's the, the, the silver lining on that cloud. It's possible to, so once you start paying attention to all these issues of data locality, data movement, parallel partitioning, maximizing parallelism, bringing that back to the CPU, we've found serious speed ups. So you can think of it as a, a torturous way to optimize your CPU code. Do you have a question? I, I guess that seems obvious in retrospect, you know, but I, I didn't think about that before. It's like, well, you know, GPUs, vectorization units, they're all similar strategies. It's all very similar now, yes. There are some, unfortunately, there are some alligators in the weeds. Um, there are some issues with trying to write code that works well on each target platform. But we'll get to that. Full on alligators. Well, I'm from Texas. No, I am. So, okay. So let's move on a little bit to OpenCL. So, so far we've talked about NVIDIA's vendor lock solution, CUDA. Really, really nice ideas buried in there. The threading model, the way it maps and scales over generations, it's gone from processes with a couple hundred floating point units up to processes with almost 3,000 floating point units without major architectural changes to the language. Some details here, some details there, but the, the, the core ideas have survived. So let's talk about the knockoff. 
OpenCL is evidently a kissing cousin of CUDA. Um, from Apple's perspective, Apple wanted to use accelerators to speed up its operating system. But Apple, as a multi-billion dollar industry in its own, doesn't want to be beholden to NVIDIA. Right? And you are. If you write CUDA, you are wholly dependent on um, X billion dollar companies' survival. So uh, Apple recognized the, the real the strengths in NVIDIA's CUDA model, but it wanted a generic model so that then it could decide whether it should put an NVIDIA chip in there or an AMD chip in there or an Intel chip in there, and then use that to, for you know, so that they're not bound up in negotiation. Okay? So they drove a standard through and organized it through the Kronos organization, the Kronos Group. Um, they have a nice website which you can go and look at. And this is Apple's bully, basically they use their position to bully both NVIDIA and AMD and others, but those are the prime GPU players, into a common standard. It's remarkable that NVIDIA did this because they had the market lead. They had market timing and it had everything, but then Apple was bigger, right? So they forced this to happen. Um, and ever since, NVIDIA's been trying to kill OpenCL. <laughs> right, um, it's, there is a broad base support, and it's all the other vendors you'd expect who want to compete on a level playing field and, and use this really very nice threading model. But it's not GPU-centric. Kind of is, but it's not entirely GPU-centric. It's supposed to be a generic way to program multi-core, many-core devices, be they CPUs or GPUs, embedded devices or whatever. It, doesn't, it shouldn't really matter from a programmer's perspective. You should just be able to write code that can execute on all of those things. That's the central philosophy. Um, this is more Kronos uh, stuff, so basically you can simultaneously write code which would uh, host code which can then drive a CPU, GPU, FPGA, whatever. And you would just compile up at runtime the kernels into a device language that those devices can understand or can use. Okay? So, Here's a sort of timeline. Back in 2000, early 2000, you had some primitive GPU languages, Brook GPU, for instance, came out of Stanford, I think. Um, but, and before that, people were even using OpenGL to program GPUs. But 2007, that's when CUDA comes along. AMD tried with its AMD Stream SDK. You can tell where the good students went to, by the way, uh, from the Stanford group. They mostly went to NVIDIA. Um, and then CUDA was released in 2007, updated in 2008, and by May 2008, you have OpenCL standard proposed. How do you develop a whole new separate uh, programming API in the space of a couple of months with a large committee of people? You don't, right? You take NVIDIA's CUDA, you change some names, <laughs> you add some features, and there you go, right? That's the only way it can happen. There's no fundamental difference between CUDA and OpenCL except for syntactical changes and flexibility. Okay? So, for instance, the terminology is slightly different. CUDA kernels are OpenCL kernels. CUDA host program, the same. CUDA thread, work item. Trying to get away from that thread terminology. Thread block, work group. And you've probably noticed I bounce backwards and forwards between them. I just can't help it. A CUDA grid is an ND range or index space in OpenCL. Those nasty local index variables, those implicitly defined CUDA intrinsics in the kernel, where you can find out where your rank is, those are DIM3 objects in CUDA, but now they're function calls in OpenCL. 
Like, show of hands, who prefers CUDA in this regard? Who prefers OpenCL in this regard? <laughs> right. Um, okay. Again, getting the grid dimensions, basically the uh, NPROX, um, they are now function calls. The syntactical decora decoration of kernels, variables, and, and memory spaces is different. CUDA uses global for functions, for kernels. OpenCL uses kernel. CUDA uses a device function, so a function that's going to be executed or called from inside a kernel is called a device function, and then in OpenCL it's just a function. In CUDA, you have constant variables with several underscores in OpenCL, just two underscores, and so on, and so on, and so on. The really irritating one is that CUDA uses shared for shared arrays. OpenCL uses local. But that's problematic because CUDA has another type of, another memory space called local. But don't let that confuse you, because no one uses that. So we'll just think of it shared versus local. Okay. Right. The memory model, the same. Basically, core has access to global memory, and then uh, these are actually subspaces of the global memory, but constant memory and texture memory. Same thing, OpenCL CUDA. It's pretty shameless. Ah, there is a pretty big difference, though, and this is what stops most people cold from ever trying OpenCL, which is setting up the device and setting up the kernels, because that is a more verbose process. And it's almost guaranteed to be more verbose, because instead of just latching on to whatever CUDA device you want to use, you've now got the world of devices. You've got AMD's implementation of OpenCL, NVIDIA's implementation of OpenCL, Intel's implementation. And under these implementations, you've got various different devices. So you've, you're sort of spoiled by choice. And this is what limits uh, what can cause some problems. So you really have to go through an active process of choosing a platform. That's whose implementation of OpenCL it is. Choosing a device on that platform. That's a CPU or a GPU or an FPGA or whatever it is. And then creating a context, that's basically going to manage your interactions with, the, with that device. And then on top of that, we need a queue, which is basically how you're going to feed in the instructions. It's a list, this set of um, operations you want the uh, device to do. So the funny thing is that actually, if you look closer at CUDA than we've looked, so we've looked at the runtime API in CUDA. But if you look at a separate, less well-advertised API for CUDA called the driver API, most of this is exposed to. So it's just that NVIDIA's runtime API is much more popular because it's so simple to get started. And that's why we start there. So let's just do side by side, um, sneakily just reminding you of how these codes are structured in CUDA and then see what the OpenCL analog is. Apple decided to be a bit of a pain, and it has its own include directory and include header file, of course. Um, setting up a platform, that's choosing who's OpenCL. Well, there is only NVIDIA's CUDA, so we're only using NVIDIA's CUDA. That doesn't, you don't change, choose anything there. On OpenCL, you're going to choose a platform ID, or get a list of platform IDs to choose from. CUDA set device, well, you might have multiple CUDA devices, so you just choose one of them numerically. Uh, OpenCL, you have to get the list of IDs and choose one. You want to create a manager? Well, CUDA, don't need a manager, but on OpenCL, you're going to basically create the context manager. I'm not expecting you to absorb this. I'm walking you through the, this kind of asinine setup phase. Now you need to get the command queue. Well, if you're using the CUDA um, runtime, then you don't need to set up a queue, but you may choose to have multiple queues running on the device, which I haven't lingered on. In OpenCell, you're required to create a queue, which is going to be the queue that you inject your, your operations into. OK. But that's not the end of it. So far, we've just chosen a device, created context on the device, 
and created a queue on that device, on that context. In OpenCL, because there's a, a sort of exponential explosion of how many permutations you can have of platform, device, and so on, now you actually have to, well, you don't have to, but you typically create your program from source on the fly. So you take the source file for your kernel and compile it as you go. So it has runtime compilation. So typically, if we have a source string, I mean, a function is just a string after all, we're going to create a program, but that's not the end of it because that's basically just like arranging that file, putting a wrap around it, claiming it's a program. Now we need to build the program. You probably ought to check that there weren't any errors when you try to build the program. And then you need to create the kernel from that program. So you're going to create a, um, you're, bundle, you're basically creating a binary blob that will get injected into the card when you want to call this kernel. Well, you don't have to do that on Kudo, at least at the runtime level. Um, and this is what the code looks like in OpenCL. You basically create the program with source, build the program, and then create a kernel from that program. Are we done? I wouldn't say that if we were, right? We're not done. To execute the, the kernel, just like in CUDA, we need to create buffers on the device. And irritatingly, we have to go through one by one and add the argument to the argument list for the kernel. People are like, what? What? Yes, that is in fact true. So where we had that two arguments going into our simple kernel, we're going to have to call set kernel log twice and tell it what the first argument is and what the second argument is. And worse, we have to give them sort of type information about those arguments. Actually, if you look into the CUDA driver model, there is in fact a similar thing going on there because again, OpenCL is CUDA. Right, once you've, let's see if I can get all this straight. Maybe you can help me. What do we do first on this device? Well, what do we do first? We create, choose a platform, yes. What do we do with the platform? Choose a device. What's next? Context, so after the context, Q. Then, you've all blanked already. What do we do after we've got the Q? Create the program with the source, build the program. For each of the kernels, we have to do this, by the way. Get the pro make sure there weren't any errors. Create the kernel from the program. Create the buffer. Set the arguments to the kernel. Then we can queue the kernel. We can make sure it's finished with CL finish. So I'm running through it quickly. We're going to create buffers. CL create buffer is like CUDA malloc. Um, running the kernel, we don't run it like a function in CUDA, we sort of treat it like a quasi-function. Here we're queuing it up with an explicit API call. But at least the kernel language is the same. <laughs> Ish, right? Global kernel and uh, indices come through um, these, these rank functions, okay? Okay. It's always fun walking people through that. It's like, what? Why would we do all that? Um, and I've posted some examples. Now, the difference between CUDA and OpenCL is that with OpenCL, you use your regular compiler. You use G++ or ICPC, whatever your, your favorite compiler is, because the host API is a, is a library. And OpenCL is not an extension. Right, there's no special syntax in the host code. You compile it with your regular compiler. You just need to be able to find the header file for OpenCL, and you need to find the libraries to link with. Otherwise, it's standard C or C++ or Fortran or whatever your preference is. I've put an example up there. There's instructions on how to compile it, regular C, C compiler, uh, link in the OpenCL library, and just run it like a regular code. I've given examples where I've done side by side of the serial kernel, CUDA kernel, OpenCL kernel, so you can see that the kernel language is one to one almost. Oops. There's a partial reduction done in OpenCL. Okay. Right. Now I'm going to do my sales pitch. There's got to be a better way. 
right? We've already seen this week you've got OpenMP, OpenMP, OpenMP4, OpenCL, we just saw now, CUDA. Also in behind the scenes, you've got pthreads and so on, and uh, uh, TBB and other thread languages. But you're, you're human. We don't expect you to implement whatever it is for whatever new architecture someone comes up with, whatever new thread model. So we really desperately need an abstraction la layer that hides all this nonsense behind the scenes. Ideally, in an ideal world, OpenCL is that abstraction layer. It can be targeted at pretty much any platform, any device. The trouble is we have non-uniform vendor support. Different vendors are putting a different amount of effort into optimizing their compilers for OpenCL. Okay, so it might be the case that the best possible compiler you can use is not the OpenCL compiler, OpenCL framework, it may be CUDA, for instance, depending on whether you're on video or not. And then we also have the question of MPI plus X. That's a buzz phrase that's gone around recently. And I say, why do we have to choose? Why can't I bury all these threading models underneath a uniform interface that I treat as, as a developer, and I'm an application developer, as well as a mathematician and whatever else. So I want to hide all this nonsense behind the scenes. And our attempt to do that is with the Ocker uh, API. So that whatever wins in the end, and I frankly don't care what wins in the end, we'll still have an implementation that runs on whatever threading model survives, okay? Um, we have to be careful to do this in a way that doesn't create some sort of massive overhead for using a, a uniform abstraction. We don't want to create some monstrous C++ code that, you know, that requires hu huge investment in atomization and then provide building blocks for somebody else, right? I want to create a thin layer that basically masks all this, um, these similarities, well, masks all the differences and similarities and just gives you a uniform interface to programming. And this is, in essence, our, our attempt to goose NVIDIA into um, playing nicely with OpenCL. So once we've targeted so far OpenMP, CUDA, and OpenCL, we tried to look at OpenACC, but it's not mature enough yet to bring into the Yocker framework. Okay. Superficially, they look very different. But I've already told you CUDA equals OpenCL, roughly. But also OpenMP equals CUDA. If you think about it in terms of vectorization, in terms of, of identifying uh, loop partitioning, it's essentially <coughs> very similar. And we've got a compound problem. We have multiple threading models and multiple different architectures. If you want to use OpenMP, you can direct it. And this is larger now with OpenMP4, I should fix that. But you can uh, basically target x86 devices. OpenACC, which kind of is going to be brought into OpenMP, um, can target certain accelerators. CUDA, you can basically target NVIDIA. And OpenCL, you can target all of them. Ideally, OpenCL would be the de facto standard, but it's not going to happen um, anytime soon. So what's our response? Well, we want to manage uncertainty, manage fragmentation. And we will play the same trick as NVIDIA plays, which is we'll leave performance up to the programmer. Okay? Appeal to their ego. But you have the rainbow of different threading models. They're all effectively doing the same thing. Why do we have to, to, to direct code, write code targeted at one of the specific models? We're not the only people looking at this. There are a number of lab projects, academic projects, industrial projects to try and create an abstraction layer above these programming models to try and um, decide or try and smooth over the differences. Okay? So from Sandia and partners, you have Cocos, which is sort of a high level abstraction. It's a uh, a matrix class on steroid, and an array class on steroids, right? 
but it has CUDA and OpenMP backends. Now, it's a heavily templated library, so they can't use OpenCL. OpenCL doesn't have anything but uh, cheap templating. You can force runtime polymorphism through um, roughly in OpenCL, but that's currently stopped them from having an OpenCL backend, but I think I'm trying to persuade them to actually put in an OpenCL backend. There's a vector class that has CUDA and OpenCL backends. We're basically creating a front-end API and a kernel language that's portable across different APIs. It has CUDA, OpenCL, and OpenMP, and pthreads backends, so that you write, as a programmer, a kernel in our language, and it's perfectly valid as OpenMP, OpenCL, pthreads, CUDA, because we straightjacket you into the way that you write kernels so that they are instantly valid in all those languages. And then there are some source-to-source -source and compiler-level um, solutions. We have uh, keep adding front-ends, so we have native front-ends of C. We'll have C Sharp soon, C++, Java, Fortran 90, Julia, Python, MATLAB. They'll all be added uh, as we go along. So you write your host code in some language, and then you talk to the Ocker API, and that will direct your kernel to the appropriate, or the, one, the, the language you choose, on the device you choose. Okay? Yes? Uh, I was curious, um, I've also heard of Thrust, but I haven't had time to look at it. Thrust is more of a parallel primitives, and um, it's sort of high level. It would, it would go up here, and it's effectively an NVIDIA product. So I do not recall if there's Thrust CL, but I could look. Um, okay. Maybe you've mentioned this, but what does it stand for, like OCA? Oh, yeah. Um, OpenMP, CUDA, CL, and ACK, but ACK never happened, or probably won't happen for a while. Okay. So what do you do? You write your host code in your favorite language, MATLAB, whatever. Um, Surprising number of people perk up when I say MATLAB. It's like, I can do this from MATLAB? Yes. You can, in the same way that you can program with CUDA in MATLAB, you can program with um, Ocker. You write your Ocker kernels in the same language, uh, in the Ocker kernel language, not in the native language. And they will talk to the Ocker API, and the API will talk to backends, the runtime from using OpenMP, using dynamic linking, pthreads, again, dynamic linking, CUDA driver API, using the MV. CC compiler for runtime compilation. We have a COI, which is the coprocessor offload interface from Intel, which allows us to direct straight to the Xeon fee. But um, that's still a work in progress, but it's running. And then we have an OpenCL backend. OK? So now, when I've trained my new students, they just have to learn Ocker. They don't have to learn all the other languages. There are some basic. Um, objects in Ocker. We have memory objects, so abstract memory object, right? That should be something just abstract. It shouldn't be a pointer to something. It should just be an abstract object that will, uh, in the back end, talk to the memory system used by each of those APIs. Similarly, we have kernel objects, abstract kernel, callable functions, which, and again, talk to the appropriate compilers behind the scene. We have a kernel language. So what NVIDIA took out of the kernel, they took the for loops out and forced the programmer to recognize that these are the inner loop, inner loop body of a parallel for loop. We forced the programmer to put the loops back in. Why do we do that? Because once you've got loop structures in, then you can OpenMP partition those loops. So we can take that thread part, thread uh, array and we can use that to partition the parallel for loops. Okay? So we've successfully squeezed together OpenMP, CUDA, and OpenCL using this uniform approach. Shared memory is an interesting case. So shared memory, remember when we wrote to shared memory, we had to barrier to make sure that everybody had written to shared memory. But what does a barrier mean in the parallel for loop context? It means that you have to close your parallel for loops, your inner for loops in this case, because it's just the inner threads that need to barrier. So you close your inner for loops, barrier, and then you open your inner for loops up again. OK? So suddenly, it's not so difficult a concept to understand really what's going on. It just basically means complete these operations in this parallel for loop structure, barrier, 
put in the next four loops, okay? There is one tricky part, which is what to do with private variables. These are variables um, which look like local variables to CUDA or OpenCL, but we're accessing them inside parallel for loops, which translate in OpenMP into actual for loops, so we have, to, we have a special definition for that. Okay. So we've got rid of this. We've unified OpenCL and CUDA with their embarrassingly close black kernel language. And we've put back in the implicit for loops. So we've now got a structure from which when you read it, you recognize that this in fact is the body code for parallel for loops. And we've got the explicit for loop structure in there. The host code, we tried to tidy it up as much as possible. So we do stuff on the host. We create a device. Where's a device? There's a device set up and at runtime, we can choose whether it's going to be OpenCL, CUDA, OpenMP, pthreads, and so on. Just by changing a string in the setup argument, we choose a platform device by number. We allocate some space with malloc on the device. We copy from A, from host pointer to device pointer, to host array to device array. Build the kernel from source. So we do have to do runtime runtime compilation, because again, we're faced with this issue. We've got a, sort of an explosion of number of combinations of platforms, devices, and so on. So we do do runtime compilation, but we've tidied that up into give it a source file, give it a function from that source file, and it'll compile it up. Design your work group thread array structure, set the working dimensions, and then this is a kernel call. It's C++. We've done operator overloading. We can literally call the kernel like it's a function. This is was something that was in the OpenCL C++ interface. I think the OpenCL C++ interface has been deprecated, and we would like that feature, so we kept that. And each of the native um, interfaces, so the C interface, C Sharp, so on, Java, MATLAB, have slightly different syntax, uh, depending on the local language. Once you've got the data, you copy it to the host array, and then you can output it. Okay? So this achieves the same thing as all those other examples, but it is at runtime we choose. What, what is the threading model you really want to adopt? And it's as simple as that. Yes? Um, so if you're using OpenCL, let, let's say it's like a, a more traditional device, a homogeneous mm -hmm. device, and you're targeting another like CPU core. Mm -hmm. uh, does it end up that a lot of the setup gets kind of skipped, or? Well, the setup is in there. The setup is there. So generically, you choose a platform device context queue. That's sort of inescapable. So that just is wrapped into that. I'm just thinking that uh, you use something like OpenMP, uh, mm -hmm. you'll spawn some threads and it'll run, say, a loop box <coughs> for several yep. processors. And with this kind of model, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's very different ways of thinking. Well, yeah, so it's, it's, not, it's not like littering a code with OpenMP directives. It's more about how would you translate this into the OpenMP code. So what happens at the kernel level? So we treat this as an offload model. And at the kernel level, um, we'll transform those Ocker out of fours into OpenMP parallel for loops. Right? But if you write decent C code that does atomize your problem to some extent, without a huge Fortran vomit of code, then you would likely have some natural partition of your code, which could be kernelized. And it would be a matter of identifying for loops which could be sent to um, parallel for loops like this. So I'm not, this isn't a magic pixie dust solution. It just will spew out OpenMP code, or it will spew out OpenCL code, or it will spew out CUDA code, passively from this code here with the right header file. Okay, and there are some details there, but not terribly interesting. And then we have C, Julia, Python, MATLAB, whatever you 
preferences. And I think I've just talked about this already. OK. Um, but what worries me is we have these competing parallel models. And it's kind of like the pre-MPI days. Who remembers PVM? BSP. <coughs> right. The gray hairs at the back. <laughs> right? Um, and it really held back distributed computing for quite a long time. Uh, this, this fragmentation of, of models for, for distributed computing until MPI comes in and bulldozes. Right? We were hoping OpenCL would do that. But not all vendors are playing well. Um, so this is our attempt just to, it's not, we don't think of this, of this as MPI for money core, but we think of this as a prototype that shows that it's possible to abstract all these things away in such a way that we can interface in the back, back end with all these different threading models without uh, significantly degrading performance. Um, however, I, it has to be said that there are several moving parts to this. It is highly likely that you might have to create more than one implementation of your kernels to target specific architectures. So, the opt so you can write a kernel or run on a CPU and a GPU, but it may get great performance on GPU and okay performance on CPU and vice versa. So we have industrial projects where the industrial partners really care about performance. Performance is money. Performance is time to solution. So they are willing to invest in multiple kernels. But one of the nice things here is we have a uniform front end, right? And then we have multiple kernels in, that run, and it can work with the back ends and multiple back ends. So then we have lots of choice to try and optimize. So frankly, it doesn't matter to me whether my kernel runs best under OpenCL CUDA or Open. I'll just choose the best model. I'll just run, time, profile, and then choose the best back end for any given kernel. That's one way of doing it, right? It's just extra direction in the optimization space for implementation of kernels. OK, so I've put in the elliptic solver. Um, includes the Jacobi iteration, uh, so you can go and look at that. And then side by side, we've got Serial, CUDA, OpenCL. And it will, I will admit my, my Ocker kernels are a little more verbose. But from the perspective of actually trying to, to train people, the hardest part, I've, I've said this earlier, the hardest part in training is getting people to understand what happened to the for loops. Putting them back in kind of gives people something to hang uh, the notion of parallel for loops on. So in serial, there's the for loops. CUDA, OpenCL, they disappear. We'll put them back in in this token form which says that really there is a par parallel partition of these, for, lo of these um, for loops, serial for loops, which is really happening. We've, de we've ported all our codes. We have finite element, discontinuous galactic and spectral element, finite difference, finite volume, and so on. Many uh, algebraic, multiple um, codes. We've ported them all to Ocker. And now we've got this fantastic paper generating machine but we've, we've tried to be constrained about it because we can generate results instantly in OpenMP, instantly in CUDA, OpenCL, and so on, pthreads, with one code, right? The opportunities to, to just like paper bomb the literature are just fantastic. Um, I'll just use this as one motivating example where we think performance um, is really important. So, this is a case where we have a project funded through NSF with the MD Anderson Cancer Center, which is a medical center in Houston. And this, they have, they're investigating a therapy for brain cancer. With other cancers, but primarily brain cancer. Um, this is brain cancer that has not responded to traditional radiotherapy. Um, it's not responded to any type of chemotherapy. So they're looking at to avoid radical intervention. They don't want to crack open the skull and go rooting around and pull out cancer. So instead, we put the patients in the MRI, identify, localize the, the tumors, and then um, 
this is pretty gross. They have to determine the best location um, to drill a hole in the skull, to inject a fiber optic probe into the brain, and then they'll light up the fiber optic probe, and the tip will be inside the tumor or near the tumor, and they'll try and heat the tumor to the point where the tumor ceases to function. Okay? Now, they have some fairly rudimentary guidelines on how to do this. Uh, as the surgeon puts it, they think of a lollipop on the stick. Sort of the, the probe has sort of a region, a kill region around it for a given specific power and a given specific duration of the therapy. So they'll think, okay, here's the tumor. I'm going to envelop that with a, with a lollipop and I'm going to kill that. But it's, it's very ad hoc. It doesn't take into account the different morphology of the patient's brain and the different tissue pro properties. So um, what we're trying to do is get into this business and give them some quantitative tools by finance element modeling and come up with an uh, inversion process where, first of all, when they run this process, they, they actually, or therapy, they run a timing, they run a, a sort of a short heating burst to, to figure out that they've got the, the, the probe in the right place. And they can use the MRI to fit, find the temperature changes. So they'll do that, and from that we intend to get some material properties that will invert out of, of, of this, um, uh, the MRI data. And then we'll do some forward modeling and then some inversion to try and figure out what's the best place to put the probe and how best to heat it, okay? But the patients in the MRI with the laser sticking out the back of their heads, you don't want them to be in there. You can't ship the data to a, a supercomputing center. You can't, you can't have this all contingent on a cluster being up. You need to do this on a workstation at, at most. So we put, in, put together a solver that uh, took, so they had a, sol a prototype solver built on libraries and whatever, and it took 12 hours to run. We put together a GPU accelerated solver and we can do this thing in 17 seconds. We're looking to bring that down to a sub-second period so that we can actually do this live while the patient's on the table. Um, we did that. There's one interesting thing. I'm just going to give you one more result. And it's this. Why did we care about Ocker? What was the driving force behind Ocker? Well, we find some weird things. We have this optimized brain solver. And when we ran it with CUDA 5.0, we'd get very similar performance between OpenCL and CUDA. Keep an eye on those, those lines. Basically, raw floating point performance. Upgrade to CUDA 5.5. I would be OK if it was just CUDA that got faster. Since they're using the same back-end compiler for both CUDA and OpenCL, the fact that the performance went down by a factor of two is a little bit worrying. So what we're trying to do is insulate ourselves from any nonsense in terms of implementations and make sure that we've got this vanilla, abstract, threading interface that means we don't have to worry about this. OK, so we've got lightweight API, multiple front ends, multiple back ends. We've even got a version for Windows now. Um, people care about Windows. We've demonstrated performance possibility for all these different numerical methods for solving PDEs. And we've got our direct multigrid ported to it. We're trying to reduce vendor lock. We're trying to smooth over the variations in the threading models. Um, and it gives you extra optimizations in auto-tuning and optimization. So I will end there. <laughs>